guys, welcome back to our next episode of Live with Heidi. Natalie Hodson, I am so dang excited to bring her on. So those of you that don't know, Natalie is actually a good friend of mine. I, I don't even remember, I'm gonna have to ask her, I don't remember how we met, but we met years ago. Um, she was one of the first people to kind of guest on my blog. She's an amazing mom of two, she's an influencer. She's best known for her ability to connect with women in their real life situation. She's wildly popular with blogging, and her social media presence, she gets more than 3 million monthly unique visitors. That's a lot. And I really think her greatest strength is her ability to um, present understandable content with this amazing flair of vulnerability. And it makes her instantaneously likable for any audience. She's built a multi-million dollar empire herself, obviously with her team, but in three short years, of writing and selling amazing digital products, eBooks, membership sites, and courses. She's a highly sought after speaker. And she's spoken on stages for Brendan Bruchard, Grant Cardone, Dave Ramsey, Birth Without Fear Conference, Russell Brunson, Dean Graziosi, and many, many more people. She has a hit podcast called Pulling Back the Curtain with Natalie Hodson that's consistently ranked in the top 200 business podcasts. She's an avid outdoorsman. Would it be called an outdoors woman? Would it? Okay. She's an avid outdoors woman and hosts outdoor wilderness, wilderness retreats for women. And she holds two state records for her fishing skills. Natalie Hodson, where are you? How do we get her on? I love, by the way, while we're waiting for her, you should go to her Instagram. She posts all the time. These amazing pictures of her with these ginormous fish. I don't know how big they are. They seem like that big to me because I haven't fished in a long time. <laughs> Natalie Hello, oh, hello, hello. Okay, hold on. Where's the face? Where's the face? Uh, I got face? The on. Hold on. There we go. Hello. 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 I just spilled water on my shirt too. So that's okay. That's look. okay. I, I'm gonna likely spill coffee at some point on my shirt. So <laughs> how are you? I'm probably all over my desk. Good. How are you? I'm so good. And that was the most amazing intro. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Heidi. That was awesome. And I'm so excited and privileged to be here today. This is gonna be a blast. I'm so happy. Well, what I didn't say in the intro is that of all of, so the, the, the blog that you guested on for me, I had a series back in the day for anybody watching this that doesn't know. And Natalie, you remember mm -hmm. <clears throat> it was called perfectly imperfect. And because I believe that is with is through our imperfections that we are made, not made perfect, but I think our imperfections are what make us perfect. And I believe those really tough times in our life are what build us. They strengthen us. They define us in the best ways. And so my first one of my, I don't know if it was my actual first, but I will say my first hit guest on that perfectly imperfect series was you, Natalie, and you literally blew my audience out of the water. I remember your video still, and you had like bent over and you had, you were showing your imperfections. You had like, you let all of your loose skin from pregnancy hang out in your video and it hit, it struck a chord like I've never seen before. And people just flooded that blog and they loved you they couldn't get enough of you yeah. I, and it's that vulnerability that i think makes you you that video went viral and i i'm super grateful for that opportunity even heidi because um that's what really brought a lot of people to my page and i think helped a lot of people too so that was a lot of fun to film i don't know you probably don't remember this backstory but i filmed the first version and it was just me talking to the camera and i think it was lisa was that her name and she was like yes we love you but this is too long nobody's gonna watch it <laughs> <laughs> I refilmed it, and then that's when I added better the second time, though, because that's when I added the different, you know, things that I was showing, and it turned out a lot better. So it, it was good, and like I think that's a consistent thing because I, I obviously knew you before that, um, but I didn't know that side of you very well. Mm -hmm. And I feel like everything of yours that I watched and followed after that, from your abs, core, and pelvic floor to all of your ebooks. That is that vulnerability and that authenticity is something that always stuck out to me. Like I remember actually in, the, I believe it was your abs, core and pelvic floor yeah. um, ebook. There was like, there was an image of you having peed your pants yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where I was like, if, wow, if like but, uh, any mom. Yeah. Not knowing what we're talking about. We wrote a program that we've put set like tens of thousands of women through that helps women um, improve diastasis recti and pelvic floor dysfunction. So uh, we're mutual friends with uh, Drew and Lynn Manning, good, good friends. Yeah. Of ours. And we have this company where we were filming workout videos and we never cut when we filmed. Well, if any of you guys here have had kids, 
you know, I, it was the one workout I happened to be wearing gray shorts and Drew wrote the workout. And so I could tell I was peeing my pants during it. And I mean, it's a little spot at the beginning <laughs> and by the end, I'm just drenched. And it was so funny because I wanted to take that video and like throw it in the trash, but it got released. And so many people came back to me and said, oh my gosh, Natalie, like me too. And that's when I realized I was onto something. And so we wrote that ebook, but there was a moment where I had to have a heart to heart with myself and say, Natalie, are you willing to tell the whole world that you used to pee your pants, you know? Um, <laughs> but, yeah, but we that video, like, thankfully, we joke now, you know, thankfully, I peed my pants on camera because that was, we used that for marketing and things, but yeah. You know, and I, I love that though, because I, it's a reminder that those things that we're so shameful of that we have a hard time opening up about, when we actually are courageous enough to let it out or to share it with somebody, those are the moments when we are not only freeing ourselves, but giving other people permission to do the same. So what you did, it actually unknowingly, it freed me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, I'm a mom and I've done that too. And it, it, it really, it's empowering. And it, it, it it's a breath of fresh air that most people never kind of release or I, I, I'm never able to feel around anyone else. So I, I applaud you for it. Well, I, and I'm sure there's a lot of women on here that are like, Hey, I, I feel it. I feel it's a real problem. It's awesome. There's a lot of good comments in the chat. By the way, I'm going to second what Heidi said. I love when you guys comment in the chat, it makes me get excited. And I feel like instead of just talking to a video screen, I'm like talking to you guys. And it's like, it feels so good when you guys comment. So I know sometimes when I'm the commenter, I'm like, should I comment? I just want to give you guys permission. Like that's, it's like, we're all in a room together chatting. I love it. Yes, I agree. It's like coffee with a bunch of people in a yeah. room. That's oh. what I love. <laughs> Um, yeah, so perfectly and perfect. I love it. I feel like Natalie, that sums you up so perfectly for lack of better words. Um, I want to go somewhere today in my, our interview that I don't feel like, um, people go very often with you. I did hear it on one podcast and it was a side of your story that I had never heard or known before. I never even asked you about it. Um, cause I wanted to save it for today. I, you obviously, what I, I, I know you as this amazingly strong and powerful businesswoman. Like when I think of you, yes, as a, as a friend, you're just so easy to connect with and you're so, um, just a beautiful person inside and out. But what most people I don't think realize about you is you are strong. You are powerful. You pave the way. You have like, literally there are no excuses. You figure everything out. You are the most probably resourceful woman I've ever met in my life. And I've loved watching you just dominate your space. Cause I've kind of seen you go through some ups and downs with business and you are just, you have tenacity that most people do not. Um, and I believe that who somebody is, I know it, who we are as people are a direct result of what we've been through in life, of our experiences, um, what we've learned, the hardships we've been through. And I heard a story about your mom um, and it was something I want my audience to hear. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Definitely. Well, and the one thing I will say, but even before we hop into that is um, for all the things that I've done, right, I've done 10 times more things wrong. <laughs> and I yeah. think sometimes we have a tendency to just look at people's highlight reel or maybe even just put somebody up on a pedestal and um, not realize like the journey that got them there. And one of the things, oh, it's really hard to hear you. Okay. I'll step up. Sorry. I also have a soft voice, so I'll, I'll stay close. To <laughs> um, if you guys can't hear me, let me know. Um, so one of the things that I believe, in fact, I have this written, one of the weird quirks about me is I have this beautifully decorated home and I have post-it notes, like giant post-it notes all over with words that resonate with me. And one of the things that I have um, next to my bed is a post-it note that says, um, identity is malleable. And the beautiful thing about identity is that identity is the story that you tell yourself about yourself. And I think that a lot of times we tend to think like, oh, I just want to get to the goal, right? And it's the goal that's going to make us successful. But the truth is most successful people I know, it's really, it's, it's falling and failing and dusting your knees off and standing back up. And it's actually the grit and the tenacity that's developed along the way that really make us more successful than like the thing itself, right? And so I think that, you know, we all we all have stories. And so to go into, to answer your question a little bit, um, and I'll keep it short. I mean, this can, this story can get long or short, but, um, 
growing up, I'm one of 10 kids. A lot of people don't know that either. I'm the oldest. And um, when, so I preface the story by always saying the goodness and the kindness in me that people are drawn to, that comes from my mom, a hundred percent. Like she's one of those people where um, you could be in a room with a hundred people and all 100 people would be drawn to her because she just has this ability to make you feel seen and heard and understood. Mm-hmm. And, um, but when I was growing up for most of my life, she was in and out of prison for different white collar kind of money crimes. And I used to be really embarrassed to tell people that I remember when I was in junior high and high school, I would just tell people she was away at college um, because I didn't want people to know my mom was in, in prison. And um, when I was 19, I had uh, gone to college, was on track and cross country scholarship. And I remember I was coming home from track practice one day. And again, um, you're right, Heidi, I don't really share this story publicly. So even yeah. my heart tracing just a tiny bit, even though yeah. I'm the person who's vulnerable, it, sometimes it still feels scary to share these stories. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I was coming home from track practice. It was a rainy day. I remember I had this little Saturn SL2 and I was running home. I was drenched from practice. And you know how sometimes you sit in your car because you don't want to go inside, you know? So I was just, oh yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm going I was renting this little basement room with a bunch of roommates. And so I was like, okay, now I'm going to get out the door and just run into the house where you can get warm. And so I yeah. opened the door and I start running into the house and I heard a stop. And I looked and there was a sheriff there. And he probably thought I was running because he probably thought I had saw him, which wasn't the case. Yeah. Cold. Um, and he just handed me an envelope and he said, I'm serving you papers. And I went inside and um, started opening the envelope and reading. And I just remember like tears started streaming down my face because I realized that uh, my mom, who I love so much, um, had stolen my identity and written like $30,000 in bad checks in my name. And the reason I started crying is because as I started reading these papers, I realized that I was going to be faced with this decision of, do I testify against my mom so I don't get in trouble for something I didn't do? Or if I testify against her, am I going to be sending my younger sibling's mom back to prison? And, um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if anybody here ever has had a dysfunctional parent or a family member who has hurt them, you know, and yeah. um, it hurts, you know, it's painful. And so I don't share the story a lot just because I don't know, I just don't always lead with it, but um, it was really valuable. And I think what I learned during this experience actually in hindsight shaped everything else that I was going to continue to do. So one of the things uh, I remember sitting at the sentencing <clears throat> The judge was in front and I was in the back. My mom was up there at the I don't know, podium, whatever you call it. And um, yeah. I remember the judge looked at me and looked at her and she looked right at my mom. She said, look, I could have given you based on your past history, I could have given you the maximum um, 25 years. She goes, but I'm just going to give you six and I'm doing this for your daughter. And she said, you've mm-hmm. had other victims in the past, but this time it was your daughter. And so, uh, Anyway, she got sentenced, and so every Sunday in college, I would drive down two hours to the women's penitentiary in in Idaho, and, you know, we had a couple months where we had to work through some of our stuff, Um, but it was, it actually became really fun, and And, um, I started to really enjoy them, and what was fun is I I started to get to know the other women in the prison, and um, one of the things that as I got to know those women that I really believe in my core is I don't believe anybody is entirely good or entirely bad. You can have every, you know, everybody has a story. You have a story. I have a story, right? Everybody has a story. And there was one moment that I will never forget the rest of my life. And I was visiting my mom. I got to know all these women, right? And the thing I was always surprised about, I was this kind of naive 19 year old girl. Mm -hmm. And these women would just share their stories, right? They would just start telling me their stories. And there's this one woman in particular, (laughs) Cheryl, and I will never forget this. Um, I mean, she was in there for like drugs and prostitution and she would tell me crazy stories that I'm like, Cheryl, ah, you're not. I'm 19. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and one day I just said, Cheryl, why are you telling me all your stories? And I will never forget this. She looked me square in the eye and she said, you know what, Natalie, 
nobody comes to visit me anymore. My kids stopped visiting a year ago. My sister doesn't visit. She's like, these women in here are all that I have. And when I start to share my stories, I feel less alone in here. And I'll never forget that because I believe that's universal truth. You know, now people know me as the girl that talks about all the things, right? But I never used to be that way. I used to, if somebody would have known me eight years ago, I was like the pot, perfect posture and I never yeah. showed anybody my struggles. And that system failed me, you know? And yeah. I, there's one, a Bernie Brown quote that I love, <laughs> and she says, when we deny the story, it defines us. But when we own the story, we can write a brave new ending. And Gosh. I believe that in my core. And, you know, there's certain things like share scars and melt wounds and, and so on. But, yeah. um, you know, one of the things... I think as humans, every single one of you guys here, all you, me, we all want the same thing, right? We want to feel seen and heard and understood. And I think because of that experience I had when I was younger, it helped me realize that, that that's really at the core what people want. And I think that's why, I've, you know, if you, the, the, the career I have now, I never thought I'd yeah. be doing that, but I love it because I get to <clears throat> connect with people. Um, so anyways, I just talked a whole lot, but that's, no, in a nutshell. And then I had a lot of stuff after to deal, to deal with. Um, the story didn't end yeah. there, really. She got out, and then, um, uh, I think I don't know. She just she has you know seven kids that she's had her own, and I think it was too hard yeah. for her to really repair that. So she moved to California and ended up. This is a sad part of the story. Um, and I only found this out through Google, but she was driving and hit a construction worker on the side of the road. Oh no. Dying. And so she was facing manslaughter charges and just fled the country. So we wow. Australia, but we're not really sure. Um but uh none of us have heard from her in, you know, like six years. And so Wow. I know, for those of you who don't know me, I don't usually leave <clears throat> you have a story, but um I think it's it's helpful to share sometimes because I think a lot of us have some, right? You might not have that exact story or anything. Yeah. Some version of somebody that in our family that has hurt us, or maybe we felt abandoned by. And yeah. uh, the tools, it, you know, some of the things that helped me, lots of therapy. I did a lot of what's called EMDR therapy. And um, I think recognizing that, you know, when you are willing to look at somebody face to face and realize that they're just a hurting person inside as well, and sometimes their actions, usually their actions aren't a reflection of you. It's yeah. a reflection of them and what they're trying to, you know, cope with and work through. Um, that's one of the things that really helped me because for a long time I was taking that old pain, that wound, and I was man not manifesting, I don't think it's the right word, but I was, you know, um, that was almost projecting projection. That's the word. Exactly. Yeah. I was projecting into all areas of my life. So once I was able to look at that little, you know, and it sounds kind of woo woo, but that little girl inside and say, this yeah. wasn't your fault. It's not because you weren't good enough. It's not because you weren't lovable. It's just that there's another hu hurting human being and you need to give yourself that love that you're craving yeah. from, from her, you know? So. I, I agree. And just, I mean, I have, I have all the feels and the emotions as you talk through your story and, um, and chills. Like it, it's, it's, it's amazing. And I think first, the thing I want to address is the reason why you don't talk about it a lot, or maybe it's still a little bit tough. I, for you, my thoughts are you, you clearly love your mom yeah. and, and like you, I, I love that about you, Natalie, because so many people, when they're hurt by somebody in their life, um, it's, it really takes, I think it evolves in a very mature person to be able to compartmentalize the hurt that they did to you and separate it from who they are as a person and the good that they gave to you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think most people are like, they did something wrong. They are wrong. They did something bad. They are bad. And I think good people, I agree with you so much when you said, um, Every, you understand every, but nobody is either good or bad. Everybody has good and everybody has bad. Everybody does good. Everybody does bad. And you identify that your mom is a beautiful person. And you said that right off the bat, almost like a big blanket disclaimer. Like, Hey, my mom is that I am who I am because of my mom. The good that I am is because of her. And you identify that, Hey, she's a good person. She's making bad choices. And you also, I love that you know that she makes those choices. Um, just because she's human and she's imperfect and we all make choices. And I, 
believe that your mom, I, I believe that humans in general, no matter how far they dig down their hole, there's always, 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 always a way out. And it might be a little bit limited. Like if somebody's in prison for life, you know what? That's I. Your story reminds me a lot of Bruce's. Do you know Bruce Pitcher very well? In fact, I listened to your guys' episode. Oh, gosh. God and, yeah. So I think you should pull up his episode from Extreme because at, during his year, his dad, who sexually abused him and many other boys, um, he was up for parole. And his parole hearing was during the course of the show. And we got to go inside and, and to see Bruce do essentially what you did, like love his dad, mm -hmm. uh, and, but love him enough, like same with you, love him enough, enough to say, dad, I love you so much. And you are better off in here. You are safer in here. The world is safer in here. And for you, like what a tough thing to be put in a position where do I tell on my mom or do I protect her? The problem is you knew protecting her was actually hurting her in the long run. Like protecting her now was not only hurting her, but hurting your siblings and hurting you in the long run. So you did what you needed to do. And I applaud you for it. And then you showed up like to show up every day or however often and to love on her. Yeah. I mean, you are, that's what sets you apart from most people. I'm sure everyone listening knows that, 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 I don't know how many people could do that. Thank you. I really don't. Well, and I think, you know, kind of along that same lines too, um, I, I quote Brené Brown all the time because she has shaped my life, but I think yeah. um, one of, and I'm probably paraphrasing wrong here, but she said something along the lines of the most wholehearted people that she knows also have the strongest boundaries. And I think that, you know, if somebody listening is in a situation where they have a family member, maybe you're not to that point yet where you can um, give that much love to them. But one thing that did help me was setting boundaries too and saying, yeah. I love you, but this is okay. And this isn't okay. And yeah. I, I'm still struggle with it. I'm not saying I'm not <laughs> <good> on that, <laughs> but, but um, you, you're aware of what boundaries need to be created at least. Right. Because then when you're yeah. actually giving time or whatever love, it's because you choose to give it, not because you feel forced to give it, you know, and it's kind and, of the same. Yeah. Weird, but you're probably similar to me. I, I always get baffled by this, Heidi. I'm like, I am a nice person. Why are people so mean to me online? It's so weird. <laughs> yes, <laughs> meanies. <laughs> um, you know, we'll get um, mean comments every day on social media or emails, and it still baffles me. But one of the things <laughs> that is that you know, hurt people hurt people, and oftentimes. Yeah. If somebody's being cruel or unkind, whether it's a family member or a stranger online or a friend, a lot of times um, it's usually more with something they're struggling with than anything yeah. with you at all. And so <laughs> what I try to do now, you know, is just set that boundary. I, I my, my initial instinct is to like be the keyboard warrior and write back and be like, yeah. <laughs> and I just learned that doesn't work. And usually it actually fuels their fire. And what I do now is I try to pinpoint what it was and what they said that um, bothered me. And I just sit with that and yeah. wrestle with that a little bit and then send them some love and, and move on. And so, you know, I think a lot of times we struggle with maybe dreaming big or if we feel like, okay, maybe I'm made for more, but I'm stuck because I'm worried about people criticizing me. Um, you know, those critical people, a lot of times it's their own insecurities. Another little weird trick, and it sounds so weird when I say this out loud. I but love I, it. I don't even know where I learned this, but you know how you can get <laughs> hundred positive comments and you get the one negative and that's all you can think about, you know? Yes, I do. <laughs> and so I've learned this weird little trick and it sounds bizarre, but it works for me. So I'll like imagine those words and I'll like put them in an imaginary cardboard box and I'll like- okay put the box on this imaginary shelf and like I swear that visualization process and you know, yeah at this point that thought that shelf is like super heavy but um that helps me too you know if anybody's struggling with being criticized or worrying too much what other people are thinking that that's a little trick that helps me I I like that and I don't think that's crazy or weird weird at all and I think a lot of people actually struggle with those uh visionary things the imaginary ways of um kind of setting limits and boundaries and healing yourself. I believe there's so much power in that because you're able to become aware and identify what thoughts are going through your head and just that process alone. And then saying, Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm going to cut these ones off. These ones I'm going to put to the side and literally taking it like, and moving it. I think that's really, really insanely powerful. Yeah. Um, yeah, gosh, Natalie, you, you are an incredible person. You really are with so much wisdom to share. And like, I can obviously see why so many people gravitate toward you. And I also, Brene Brown, 
she's one of my absolute favorites. Mm -hmm. Um, And actually there was something you had said in your perfectly imperfect blog that I wanted to just kind of go into that I think connects to all this. You said, I know how empowering it feels when it finally clicks that perfection is a myth. And when you learn to show yourself grace, grace during your imperfections, that this can become your biggest strength. And I think for you, like I, as I hear you speak, even about how you deal with um, haters on social media, I feel like a big reason why you're able to get past um, any negativity that comes your way is because you are wholehearted and you are w- working on at least or feeling complete or at least working on it at every given point in time. Um, and you are confident with the woman you are becoming and the intentions you put into everything. There's no question for you. So you're able to look at what they say and say, I'm imperfect, but I'm trying really hard. And you're able to give them that compassion and grace themselves and say, they are an imperfect person. Um, I'm going to let them slide on this. And I, I agree with you. Um, social media has been something that's uh, callous. It, it's created some amazing calluses for me. I mean, calluses, I think are a good thing. It's like when we lift weights, right? We get, we get calluses. So we don't keep blistering, popping open and bleeding on our hands or whatever it is. I, I we have calluses for a reason. I think the same is with our soul, right? There are certain things. It's like we learn to protect ourselves over time, not build walls. I think there's a difference between building a wall and callousing ourselves a little. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I when things come in, I kind of do something similar, but I'll read it and it'll be like, you're a terrible mom. You never give your kids time. You travel all the time. And for me, what I'll do is I'll be like, okay, I'm going to assume their intention, whether I'm right or wrong, is to help me be a better mom because they care for my kids. So what I've done is I'll reply and be like, thank you for your intention. I know you care so much about my kids that you want to make sure they have the best mom. You know what? And a part of you is right. I should spend more time with my kids, blah, 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 blah. And I usually will kind of give a thing. And for them, I love the reply. I'll usually turn a hater into a lover that way. Cause they're like, Oh my, and then they feel bad. They're like, wait, there's a person reading this. I'm like, yes, there's a person reading this and it's me and it hurts, but I'm going to act like it doesn't, you know? And sometimes just even I mean, same. And you've, you've been through a marriage, right? Yeah. A marriage that now is, um, the, uh, the relationship looks different. We'll talk about that in a minute, but it's like, as you know, I'm going through a divorce again right now. I don't even know if you know this. Do you know that? I just saw that on social media the other day. So (laughs) yeah. Yeah. We have a lot to talk about. You can go that route if you want to. So yeah. Well, and, and part of that is, you know, as you're going through a process like that, now it's my second time, you almost have to be like, okay, there's hurt no matter what. And when things are said, whether I say it and I shouldn't say it, or he says it and he shouldn't say it, um, the best thing I know I can do is say, okay, let me just understand his intention. His intention is to protect his kids or protect himself or protect what we have, you know? And so just identifying intention, um, even if it's, even if their intention is bad, it's like, hey, if you can find something positive and spin it, that's been super helpful for me. So what a lot of people don't know on here is you have, how long ago did you go through your divorce? I've been divorced five years. So I really, wow. Yeah. So I built my whole business as a single mom as well. And, um, it's, uh, you know, you never get married thinking you're going to get divorced. I actually heard you and Chris talking about that on your episode a couple yeah. months ago, you know, and yeah. um, I think it's hard because especially it, you know, I mean, everything, we all have hard stuff that we go through. Um, but I think for me, gosh, I don't even know what direction we want to go there. But one of the things that was really helpful for me is to um, understand my own unspoken expectations. Cause I think unspoken yeah. expectations can be the killer of a lot of relationships and then recognize yeah. where those are and try to communicate that because, you know, gosh, I can look back on my marriage and, and now in hindsight, look at so many things that I would have done differently, you know, but, um, I think what we can do, I think a lot of times, you know, we kind of talking about perfectionism, what we were talking about earlier, those of us for a long time, my identity was wrapped up in being perfect. Right. And yeah. I got three P's now. So the, the three P's are perfectionism, paralyzation, procrastination. Cause if you think you have to be perfect and then you can't, you procrastinate. And then when you procrastinate, you feel paralyzed. And yeah. one of the things that I've tried to do is shift my identity instead of wrapping my identity around achievement or perfection. 
I have tried to base my identity around being a learner, right? And recognizing I don't always have all the answers, um, but if my identity is my ego is wrapped up in I want to learn, I want to be better, then when you fail, it doesn't become such a, I think you used actually in your interview with Chris, the word scarlet letter, right? Or it yeah. doesn't become such a wound because yeah. me, I look at failure, well, I, I can say this as a statement, but it's still hard when you're going through failure, right? Um, but I can, I try to look at it now as, okay, these are data points in my experiment and I'm learning from this data, right? And when you can actually assess yourself and do that, sometimes failure then isn't so bad because you can look back and say, okay, this is where I could have done better. This is what I could have done differently. And if you're willing to dust your knees off and stand back up, you can actually, that's how you improve, right? That's how you get better. Um, I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. I actually, so I, I'd say the same thing, but we actually, <clears throat> the, our team says, is it what, which F word do you want to choose failure or feedback? Yeah. Cause that's yeah. really what it is. It's yeah. like, you can call it a failure or you can call it feedback. It's yeah. just a thing. Like we're literally speaking the same language with different words. You and I, I love that. Well, and, um, you know, the divorce thing is hard, especially, you know, learning, navigating co-parenting. So, yeah. Um, that this was new to me. So I had never co-parented before. And thankfully, you know, we've been divorced long enough now that it's, it's not as, it's not as an open wound. Like it was right at the beginning. Yeah. It wasn't good at the beginning. Um, yeah. and I wouldn't say that, like you, you, you can like be really good friends with your exes. I try to keep a little bit of distance there. Like I wouldn't say we're friends necessarily, but we co-parent really, really well together. Yeah. Um, he's remarried. Yeah. We have, you know, they've got, other little kids and no oh. if there's anybody that's listening that is maybe has gone through divorce the one thing I tell all my girlfriends I'm like this is the weirdest little trick but it helped us so much so um <laughs> what used to happen is I talked to him only about the kids you know but then he he would have to like communicate that to his new wife and it was this weird and you know men aren't really good communicators anyways <laughs> we did one thing that changed the entire dynamic is we just started communicating in a group three-way text so then that way like she saw all the communication things were getting lost and both either of us were like come on why, why aren't you talking you know and um she is an amazing amazing woman and I feel really grateful that the kids have such a good stepmom but that one I little, love that worked so good because then it's not that weirdness like why is your ex-wife texting you and then yes do 90 percent of the communication you know i think that's great and I, I can relate i derek and i have been divorced for 13 years Derek, 12 years a long time we've been divorced for a long time and it, it took time for us to kind of figure out you know our our rhythm and figure out and we i i consider him one of my best friends now i think he's an, an amazing person he's a great co-parent with me and it's i think again it boils down to intention to intentions i might not do everything he sees fit for me to do and he might not do everything i see fit for him to do but at the end of the day we both are willing to sit there and say okay i he always says, I care about you because you are the mom of my kids. And I, I want the mom of my kids to be happy and healthy and loving. And I, how can I support you? Like, that's so huge for me to hear. And he hearing him say that helps me always reciprocate the same. And say, I care about him because number one, I care about him. And he's also the father of my kids. And if I want my kids to be happy, he needs to be happy, you know? So it's just, but that communication because now, I mean, I cannot believe how tall and beautiful and handsome your children are. Oh my gosh. I know. So tall and handsome. And I'm like, oh, I heard, I heard <laughs> with a little boy, you know? I know. He's like, he's like a even more handsome Justin Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> he's so boy. cute. Maddox is, is so cute. And Marley's getting so big. I know the kids are just getting crazy. Um, so I want to know, because you've obviously been through a lot in your life from divorce and so many different business attempts. And I've kind of seen a lot of different things that you've gone through and um, obviously what happened and how you grew up with your mom. And I, I think I remember hearing you actually raised your siblings after your mom went away. Correct. I mean, yeah. you've had so yeah. many things. Yeah, but I was there and super, I actually transferred colleges to be back closer to home and stuff like that. Wow. Wow. So I want to know the key takeaways, the key things that you feel like you learned from all of your experiences that have lent you to be 
as powerful, that's the word I'm going to use, as you are, because you are a powerful force. Totally. Well, I think, you know, a couple things. I think a lot of times um, we stop ourselves from doing that thing that we like inside. We're like, oh, I feel like I'm made for more or I want to try that, but I'm scared or maybe I'm not good enough. And I think a lot of times we stop ourselves because we think we have to be the expert before we go and do something. And I think having that mentality of like embracing your identity as being a learner has been one of the best tools that I've had because instead of feeling like I have to go get the education or be the expert, the truth is more people are actually really interested in the journey along the way. Yeah. And so if you can just look at somebody who's two steps behind you, you know, I teach this a lot in my business course is that you don't necessarily have to be the expert. You just have to be able to help somebody who's a couple steps behind where you're at right now. And sometimes that can even be more powerful because you really yeah. have empathy. You understand where somebody's coming from, you know, and I think that's one thing I think, um, you know, focusing for me that identity is malleable. Like I, you know, I, I always say, I mean, I was a history major in college, Heidi. I don't know if you know that, but if you, no. would, yeah, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, I'd be like, what, what are you going to be doing? 10 years? Like, I just never in my wildest yeah. dream fathomed it. Um, but I think it's because I shared the journey along the way. I was willing to not pretend like I had all the answers all the time, but I was sharing yeah. where I was going. And for me, that's really what helped build the audience and the brand. Um, I think for me, um, therapy. Okay. So I used to be that person that was like, I got my shit together. I'm good. <laughs> That's for like the broken people. And yeah. I wish so badly. I would have dropped my ego years ago and yeah. just started going. And, um, I really like EMDR therapy. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's okay. for people. Yeah, I have. And yep. I was in a weekly standing Monday therapy appointment for nine months, every single week. And it changed my life. It really did. And really? it recognized that, yeah, you, you're good. You can accomplish all these things, yeah. but there's still these wounds that are projecting in your life in different ways, you know? And so that was something that really helped me. Um, yeah, I think just showing yourself some grace, you know, I think yeah. times we look at other people and we start to talk down to ourselves. Like, how come I can't look like her? How come I can't have yeah. the power that she has? How come, you know, and the truth is like, we're all doing the best we can with where we're at right now. And that has been something that has helped me so much because, you know, I could look back and beat myself up over things that I did wrong or said wrong or failed yeah. or failed. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you, you stay stuck in those areas. And so I think one of the most important things I had to do was address the areas that I had shame in because I think yeah. we're always going to hit a ceiling wherever we have shame. And that's hard yes. to do, right? It doesn't feel comfortable. But once I was able to do that, that's when I was finally able to break free of those chains that were holding me down of feeling like if people know this part about me, nobody's going to like me. Or, yeah, you know, if I tell people that this happened, nobody's going to accept me. And the truth is that when you're willing to really look at those areas and recognize I was doing the best that I could with what I knew at the time, which is hard to do. It's hard to share yourself. Yeah. We wanna, sometimes we want to beat ourselves up, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I think the last thing is I put so much emphasis in my life on just taking action. Like at the end of the yeah. day, I learned that from Tom Bilyeu. He's like, if you guys aren't following Tom Bilyeu, he's amazing. He's so great. Yeah. Um, he taught me the value of taking action is all that matters, even if it's imperfect. Yeah. Action. And, you know, I look back like, my very first website, I wish I had, you know, it was like a black screen with aerial white font. And I think I'm pretty sure I was taking flip phone photos back then, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I would have been afraid to get started because I would have looked at whoever's websites. And, yeah. and, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the iPhone, right? Like if I had iPhone 1.0 in this hand and if I had like the new iPhone on this hand. Yeah. Yeah. The iPhone sucks compared to this one. But they had to put out the 1.0 version to even know what bugs they were going to have or what to fix before they could do the 2.0. And I think a lot of times we get stuck in that comparison trap where like, yeah, I need it to be perfect before I can put it out there. And the truth is, it's actually yeah. probably what you learn along the way that's going to make you have a better final product. Maybe when we never even have a final product, we're always evolving, right? Yeah. But I think like when we I are business um, aspect, a lot of people say, how did you build this? How did you start this? 
And I think a lot of it is I was willing to be a student. I put blinders on and I found a handful of people that I looked up to and wanted to be like, and I would model, I like obsessively take in their content. Yeah. And I was willing to say, I'm not always going to be perfect or great. And that's okay. Like it's actually the process that's more important than the end result, you know? Yeah. And I've heard you say that a few times today. And I think that's one of the biggest takeaways. I'm, I, I, there's so many things I'm getting out of what you're saying. Um, and again, there's a lot that we connect on and we're very similar in, but the one thing that keeps coming up is you talking about the journey, not the end result. And I, I totally concur. Like I believe the people that are so focused on hitting that goal or getting to that place, or when I'm here, then I'll be happy. Those are the people that are almost always sorely disappointed and they're constantly and consistently miserable in life where when you learn to appreciate the process. Uh, leading to a goal, whether it's getting on stage and you're learning to appreciate the working out and the diet and nutrition, you know, or it's, you know, getting to a place where you can do X, Y, Z with your family. It's like it appreciating the process and what it takes and, um, and what it means about you is worth so much more. And that is what always leaves me feeling like a better, happier person. It's the idea of letting go of the past not over obsessing about the future, but being present in the moment, yep. you know, and actually enjoying what is right now, because you don't know if you're going to wake up tomorrow. Totally, You're well, never going to be able to change the past, but here, right here and now we have. Totally. And even like in Hollywood, if you look at it, Hollywood's really good. Like yeah. think of Rocky, right? He doesn't yeah. like, beat Apollo Creed in the final scene, but we love Rocky because we've seen the journey or like, yes, you know, yes. Lightning McQueen, right? He doesn't win. The yeah. Movie. End, but we love him because we see the journey. And I think a lot of times, you know, not just those of us who have a following or whatever, but in our real lives, a lot of us have a tendency to say, Oh, I don't want to share the journey because people are gonna, it's gonna, I'm gonna feel embarrassed. They're gonna judge. Right? Yeah. But the truth is, that's when people want to rally and cheer you on the most. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I, I guess if you could, if I were to pick a consistent theme between all the different areas that we've talked about, um, that would be it is like just embracing. I know it sounds cheesy, cliche, embrace the journey, right? But yeah. also just recognizing like everybody has to have a starting point. And if you're always yeah. too afraid to start, you're never going to be able to even make a little bit of progress. And so, yeah, I, that's in a nutshell, I guess what I would say there, you know? I, I love that. Now, I don't want to go too far before we talk about, I know you have a really cool 21 day find your compass challenge. Yeah. Can you tell us about it? Because everything you do is amazing. So <laughs> I, um, I, I want to hear about that. Totally. So, you know, it's funny because I started in the fitness space and I always say I accidentally fell into the fitness space. It was just because I was trying to get back in shape after having 10 pound babies. And, um, and so I was writing fitness programs and I loved, I loved it. But I got to the point where I started to realize a lot of people were coming to me because they thought they wanted to lose 20 pounds or they thought they just yeah. wanted to shape. But the truth was it was a lot of the mindset stuff that people were getting stuck on every time. <clears throat> and so I started to create content more around mindset shifts. And um, that's really the focus of my brand. I mean, we'll, we'll always do the fitness stuff, but I get really excited about this part of the brand. And yeah. And so I created the 21 day challenge really by listening to things that people were coming to me and saying, I'm struggling with this. And so it's 21 days and, and we just named it find your compass. Cause I love like backpacking and hiking. Yeah. So everything's the mountain yeah. in my program, but yeah. it's how to get unstuck. So you can rewrite your story. So week one, we look at the internal reasons that people get stuck. Things like we've talked about today, shame or um, perfectionism, things like that. We look at, the external reasons people get stuck, lack of support from family members or time or money. And then we give you the tools that you need to move forward in week three. So it's really fun. I love that. What we've done so far has been even better than the last one. And um, awesome. Last challenge, at the end of 21 days, we had 19,000 engagements in our Facebook group. Like in 21 wow. days. Wow. Oh my gosh. That's so insane. Yeah, that's that's so cool. Well, We'll make sure we get a link out so everybody can join that wants to join. Before we close, though, I see a really great question from Jen. It says, she says, why do you each pursue entrepreneurship and not a typical corporate nine to five? Do you have a common trait? Jen, thank you so much for the question. Natalie, I'm going to let you answer first because I'm super curious. This is on the fly. This is on the fly. Oh, and I'm, I'm curious to hear what you say. Okay. I don't know if I have a, I mean, I've done nine to fives. I've done a lot of those. Um, you know, my 
drive, the reason that I started building businesses was when my son was little, um, uh, we were $170,000 in student loan debt at the time. And I just needed a way, I, I didn't want to pay to put my baby in daycare and I needed to find a way to bring income in from home because yeah. we were drowning under the student loan debt. And so that's kind of wise because I looked at the numbers and I was like, okay, hey, yeah. I can spend my time at a nine to five and make, <clears throat> make decent money. But I thought if I'm willing to risk and build my own business, I can make so much more with that exact same amount of time than I would ever be able to do working for somebody else. And so that yeah. was the motivation behind it. Um, okay. And then for me, I also think uh, the impact you're able to have, I don't know that for me, that's my driver. I love helping people, yeah. serving people. I just feel like um, I can do that in a larger scale than if yeah. I were clocking in each day. Okay. I love that. I love that. That's a very good answer. So Jen, if I answer again, great question. Thank you. Um, and I've never actually thought about this, but why do I pursue entrepreneurship and not a typical nine to five? So like Natalie, I have worked a nine to five, but not for very long. Um, I think the best way, so a couple things, number one, I grew up in a family, uh, where my dad always worked for himself. And so I got to see the freedom that came with it, but I also saw the uh, passion and the, the work ethic that he had to put in. So I only knew giving everything you had, he set really great boundaries too during this time period. And then when I'm home with the family, work is off, like not doing it, but he devoted, he, my dad was all into everything he did when he was in this moment with us, with me, he was all into the moment with me. Um, so that, that was my example. And I think just for me and, um, people that know me would probably agree. I am kind of an untamable, free spirited, wild horse slash heart. <laughs> I am. And I like to be able to pursue what I want to pursue. And sometimes I don't even know where I'm going. I just know I want to go. And when I go, I am all in and there's so much passion in every single thing that I do. I don't like to be bound. I don't want to feel like I have to do something. I want to feel like every single thing that I do is something I want to do. Um, and so, and at any point in time, I love knowing if I don't enjoy waking up and doing these lives, I don't have to do it. Yeah. I don't have to do it. Now there are things like part of me not working a nine to five was um, taking on a commitment, like doing the show extreme weight loss. And I never will quit a commitment halfway through. When I commit to something, I am all in through the entirety of my commitment. But that commitment was a part of me working for myself. Does that make sense? It was a choice that I made. And when the commitment was fulfilled, I could decide, okay, do I want to do that again? Or do I want to do something? Where's my heart at now? Where am I impacting the most people? Where do I want to be? So I think that would be my answer. I just, I, I don't think I would fit very well into a corporate environment. Not to say for a period of time, I wouldn't do it knowing that the bigger picture is me kind of controlling my own thing. So <laughs> Derek, Derek back here said, I'm a bull in a China shop. <laughs> yes, I am. Well, <laughs> I would be. I would do. I don't, I don't and, hours than I ever would at a nine to five with my own company. I love it. Right. I'm not, yeah. Hard. I just love it. So I work my butt off and I think yeah. People that get to know me in like real life, they're like, I had no clue the amount of work you put into this. Yeah. We don't show, you know, people just see what you put on stories. Yeah. Fun stuff. They don't see all the work. They don't. Things, you know, it's true. It, it is so true. Um, Derek, that was funny, by the way, Bull in a China. And I actually, there's a, there's a company that I were doing a partnership with right now. And every time I go visit, I am breaking rules right and left and I don't even know it. Like, I just don't know how to follow rules. Like it's a problem. I try. I just don't know how to follow rules. Okay. Um, just say the box and then you make the rules. I know. And if I set a rule and I'm breaking it, then I can take the rule away for everybody. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, Tara, if we have a second, I think that's a good. Yeah, question. that's actually, I think let's go ahead and read it. Okay. So what's your best advice for dealing with mom guilt as a mom who's an entrepreneur? Do you want to yeah. go first? Um, okay. Oh. Yeah, I'll go. I'll go first. Actually, you're the guest. You go first. Okay. 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 Well, you know, I don't think it ever goes away. I think always in some capacity, we're probably going to feel guilt in some way. Um, one of the things that I constantly remind myself is I'm the only one who can give my children a happy mother who loves her life. Nobody else can give that to them. And 
I started to tell myself all the time that Natalie, when you spend a little bit of time on yourself every day, you're actually allowing yourself to give everybody else around you what's best of you, not just what's left of you. And so specific to work as an entrepreneur, you know, one of the things people always want to know, like, how do you balance everything, Natalie? And I always come back and I just say balance is a myth. And I think once we embrace that, we'll be so much happier because, you know, I think of it like an orchestra, right? So let's say we're going to the symphony and you come in and again, I'm, I don't know all the instruments, but let's say you come in and like the flutes and the, the wind instruments are really dainty and beautiful and quiet. And then all of a sudden it gets dramatic and the drums start beating and then you have like the cellos and stuff. And it's beautiful because it all works together. But if every single instrument in that orchestra were to all play as loud as they possibly could, you would like cover your ears and turn <laughs> back, right? That, yes. What makes an orchestra beautiful is how they work together. And so I try yeah. to think of that sometimes, you know, if we're doing a product launch, for example, we're launching a new thing in our company that might be the drums when the drums are really loud and maybe my kids are like the flutes and maybe I let them have more iPad time during that week or vice versa. If the kids are on spring break, I won't plan a whole lot for my, uh, for my work stuff because I know the kids are me running around like crazies. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, I've, I've looked to nature a lot for advice and even in nature yeah. balance doesn't exist. Like you couldn't balance a basketball on your finger forever. You couldn't stand on one foot forever um season there's a reason and I think that once we actually let go of the idea that we have to balance it all and instead look at the beauty like the symphony the beauty of like some things are louder some things are quieter and that never is always going to be the same you feel a lot better about it that's kind of I I love that and I actually will just adopt your advice because it was so good I don't think I have anything left to anything left to to add besides maybe and and I think you said it in your own words but for me it's most important that my kids know that I love them that is and and through our actions and through the the things that you're saying um or however way like it, it, if my kids know that I love them my mom guilt is minimal it is and I kind of like having a little bit of mom guilt because it pushes me to be better you know I'll add one last thing so I I talked with therapists about this one time because I was yeah and he said, here's the thing, Natalie, research all shows. There's really only two things that kids need to be successful. Yeah. Adults. And I was like, really? And he's like, one is they have to know that they're loved unconditionally without condition. Yeah. And two, <clears throat> just knowing that there's um, consequences for their behavior, both good consequences and bad consequences. And he said, yeah. all the other stuff doesn't matter in the long run. It's those two things, knowing that there's consequences, good and bad, and that they're unconditionally loved. You know, who said that? My therapist, he's amazing. Oh, I love it. That's amazing. I think your therapist needs to come on and <laughs> spread some love. That's amazing. I know. I he's amazing. Oh, I, I think that that advice right there probably struck a chord with a lot of people. And I know we are out of time. It is already one o'clock. The hour with you just flew by, Natalie. You are amazing. I, I see everybody is loving you and loves you guys. Um, make sure you follow Natalie. Natalie, where can everybody find you? Yeah. So my last name often gets spelled wrong. It's Hodson. So H O D like David S O N like Nancy, but, um, my website is NatalieHodson.com. I love, I do my own Instagram for the most part. Um, and so I love engaging with people there. Uh, Facebook is Natalie Hodson official. So kind of just my name wherever. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natalie, for being with us. I loved having you here and to everybody here watching. Thank you 